Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Nintendo goes crazy for cardboard, motion capture without cameras, and is your smartphone the best camera? Live from the Twit Eastside Studios in the beautiful Pentaluma, it's the new screensavers. Yeah! A lot of people in the studio. Welcome to the new Screensavers episode 153, recorded April 18th, April 21st, 2018. Step into the future, man. Yeah, I know. That was April 21st, 2018. We got a room full of Australians, and we're filling in for Leo. That's right. We're, we are not Leo Laporte. No. You're Megan Maroney. I am Megan Maroney. And I'm Jason Howell. Mm -hmm. I think together we might add up to Leo, but then we have no guest. Uh, certainly, maybe between our height, we might <laughs> Well, I was add trying up to, to kind of hold the, the little crouching position yeah. earlier, but that's just weird. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. We're just going to have the deal. How you we doing? are. I'm doing good. <laughs> Haven't seen you since Thursday. <laughs> I know. I feel like it's been forever. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we, we have hot topics. Yes, let's that do we'll the hot topics. To. Not quite yet, though, because we got to kind of tease forward. Oh, right. But I was going to say, we got the hot topics, so that's like a little familiarity mm -hmm. with what we normally do on Thursdays mm -hmm. with Tech News Weekly. But that's not happening yet. Uh, we're going to be talking, actually borrowing producer of this show, uh, one of the producers of the show, Karsten's kids, Zach and Alex, because they've been playing around with the new Nintendo Labo kits. You probably know all about these. Like I, I'm just being introduced to these today, and I love them. These little DIY cardboard kits. Yeah, they just came out. They're really I I I'm amazed. And uh, they say Karsten didn't help them at all. Mm -hmm. uh, they would not let him help them. And you're going to be really amazed to see nice. what they see. Uh, we are also Jason took one for the team. We uh, <laughs> we had a guy with a motion capture suit, and I've already worn a motion capture suit. I've done that yeah, uh, done when that. we went to 2K Games, and it was lovely and tight and. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Jason, it's your turn. So this is a different kind of motion capture suit. So stick around to see him in that suit. You really oh, enjoyed great. it a little too much. Uh, yeah, well, it was fun. I've never had the chance to do that before. Mm -hmm. um, although it was a little constricting, but you'll find out here soon why. Uh, we've got a call for help, of course. Uh, some uh, smartphone cameras. We're going to kind of dive deep into a question around the, the Pixel 2 XL and, and kind of the, the quality of camera uh, pictures that you get out of that. Rishi Sanyal from DP uh, Review is going to be joining that conversation. And then we have the mailbag. We have an iPhone and an Android question, I believe. Yes. We, mm -hmm. we were kind of split evenly between those. But now, now let's get to our hot topics. What's All right. the first one? What is the first one? Well, I feel, okay, so I haven't been to San Francisco uh, in at least, a, I don't know, probably not in the last three or four weeks. Uh, but within that time, I started hearing all this stuff about electric scooters. Maybe you've heard about this too, how scooters are basically taking over the sidewalks in San Francisco uh, in a similar way from what we heard, you know, not, not very long ago, a few years ago, with Uber kind of coming in, revolutionizing, revolutionizing how you get around the city. You, now it's now it's pretty standard. Well, electric scooters apparently being left all over the sidewalks uh, through San Francisco. People find them. You know, different companies like Bird, uh, Lime Bike, Spin allow you to basically just hop on one and take it where you need to go and, and rent it uh, as need be. And the city is not very happy about that. Well, that's because people are just leaving them around. They were just like, I'm done. Like I'm I'm just just leave it there. Like Looks city super bikes. Sloppy. Yeah, city bikes have also existed. It's like what they're calling like the last mile of transporta transportation. Uh, back in my day, that was just walking. But <laughs> apparently people don't do that so much anymore. They need to, uh, if they're not going to take an Uber, they're going to uh, take a bike that they borrow or they're going to take a scooter right. or um, some other way, your jet pack. I think the thing that Carson's kids built, I think that's going to be the next thing that will like, fly <laughs> on your cardboard. That's um, at least two years from now, the jet packs. Mm -hmm. but. but yeah, people are just leaving them around and the other people are dropping them. And, you know, it's like this is the age of the tech lash, which I said I would never use that 
that phrase, the backlash against tech companies, because I feel like tech lash should more be like an internet connected fake eyelash company, but, but. that's another story. People are not happy with the tech bros. And this, yeah. they're like, no, you can't, you've disrupted enough, we're outlawing it. Yeah, and I mean, the Board of Supervisors, they're actually considering a bill right now that would uh, grant authority to the city to crack down on this even further, require these companies to have some sort of a license to operate, require uh, people who are using these to be wearing a helmet, uh, you know, basically jump through some hurdles to ensure that there's some sort of regulation, some sort of control over these things. I mean, when you see the pictures of the, the scooters just kind of hanging out in the grass, it's like, well, I'm done with it, <sighs> just falls on the grass and it feels very chaotic and like I, I can kind of understand. Mm -hmm. I, would, I, would, I would get a little irritated about that too, but I haven't experienced it firsthand. I also haven't experienced walking through a city and being like, man, I could really go for a scooter right now. <laughs> oh, there's one and you hop on and you go. That's actually kind of cool. Yeah, well, I mean, they've been doing it like a Berkeley with bikes, you know, just like a bike, you'll just leave the bike and then you'll take it. Like that's totally free. Um, and then the city, the city bikes I mean, in D.C., I don't even know if they have these much in San Francisco, but in D.C. and New York, where I just was, they had them, but they're sponsored by Citibank. So it's like, that's kind of an eyesore, too. It's like this big advertisement with bikes on it. Right. But a lot of people use them. It's super nice to be able to just stick your credit card in and ride, and then you park it in another place. Because so unlike bikes, which you could steal, the scooters, they don't go. They don't, I mean, they could scoot, but the electric part of them doesn't go unless you, you know, put your credit card in or whatever. Uh -huh. Use the app. Right, right, to kind of unlock it. Mm -hmm. And I think they're also considering, you know, to, to make sure that people are kind of being responsible with where they put these afterwards, considering implementing some sort of a system where the users actually have to, or maybe they have already done this, where you have to actually take a picture of the scooter when you're done mm -hmm. using it to show that you've properly put it in its place. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who knows where this is all gonna kind of land? Um, you know, these companies have had resistance in other markets as well. Santa Monica just uh, fined Bird $300,000 for uh, for failing to get a proper business license in that area. And it just, like you said, it kind of flies in the face of this this attitude that we've seen in Silicon Valley and in tech in general for a while now, which is just like, hey, you know, move fast, break things. We don't kind of slow down to do these things like get a, you know, get a permit or whatever. We'll ask for forgiveness instead of asking for permission. And we're kind of seeing a pushback against that right now. Yeah, and I think that people don't like scooters. Like when we rode those segways for the cold open, like people, people laughed at us, people screamed at us. <laughs> um, and even in Petaluma, just people don't like the idea of people riding on scooters, like electric bikes. It's right. similar to that kind of phenomenon. Like if, you know, push yourself with your own legs, there's that kind of divide of like, why, why do you need a scooter? Or but sharing the sidewalk, because you know, you think of the sidewalk as a place where we walk, mm -hmm. not a place where there are motorized vehicles zipping past you in every direction. So mm -hmm. I can understand. The next big story this week, Smug Mug uh, bought Flickr. And if you don't know what Smug Mug is, Smug Mug is, is similar to Flickr, but it was a paid site. I don't know, I had my pictures up there. I still, I just went and checked. I still have all my pictures on Smug Mug. And uh, they just bought Flickr. Flickr, of course, was owned by Yahoo, was bought by Yahoo, which is now Verizon, but called Oath, Oath. for some reason. Oath. Oath. So they have broken the chains of Oath, and now they belong to Smug Mug, which is weird, because Smug Mug is a lot smaller than Flickr. So here's mm -hmm. this giant, uh, day, you know, giant community of photographers on Flickr, and then now Smug Mug, which is quite smaller, and was more on, like, you really had to pay to have an account most of the time. Um, but it, they're both for photographers. That's the thing that's in common. People who really like to shoot raw and keep their raw, you know, photos from cameras. I think it's really interesting because when Smug Mug started, uh, photography in general, and when Flickr started, was really different than it is now. Like, I mean, you'd ask any photographer who's been around, and they're like, the whole... Uh, industry has really changed because now yeah. everyone is taking pictures, tons of them and putting them up and no one really cares as much about the quality of photos as they used to. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens. It's kind of like we take the ph photography aspect of everything that we do online for granted because like you said, everybody offers it. Mm -hmm. Apparently Smug Mug is an older company than Flickr. Smug yeah. Mug's been around, I mean, slightly older, you know, like maybe a year older or whatever. Um, but their plans right now, from from what I was reading, is to not really change things. They're, they're, it's almost like they're saying, we, we bought Flickr because, well, it's Flickr. We're not really quite sure what we're going to do with it, but we're really not going to rock the boat. We're not going to change very much, and we'll figure it out over time, which mm -hmm. apparently is how Smug Mug in general, you know, as a company, has really kind of existed up until now. It hasn't had like a serious, like, you know, spelled out plan from the beginning. It's just been kind of following along 
for what its users actually wanted and then following that direction they had the same plan with Flickr. Yeah. I mean, I used to think of Smug Mug more as like where you put your real photography as opposed to Shutterfly like back back in the oh, okay. day, like you know, then in the 2000 the early 2000s. Yeah. Um and that, you know, that was where you really uploaded if you had more than just if you if you put them on Shutterfly, they would reduce the quality, but if you put them on Smug Mug, they could, you know, they had all this storage which was amazing at the time right. and not so amazing now necessarily so now I, I, once again we take that for granted mm -hmm. I think now um, something that uh, well maybe you take take this for granted because on iOS you've already figured this out but on us Android users apparently this is a lesson that's never learned by Google but uh, Google has plans to uh, you know finally get serious about messaging uh, which if that sounds familiar, it's because it totally is. I feel like we're here every one and a half to two years where Google decides it's going to fix messaging on Android. Uh, but apparently it's something called chat. And what's different, so first of all, the bad news. If you're an Allo user, you know that thing that they touted a year and a half I ago and said, this is our new big big thing, big effort. I think it. you're the only Allo user. <laughs> I, we only use it for all about Android because I feel like we have to. It's Google's messaging <laughs> app and we use it for uh, the show. But apparently they're taking all of the staff from Allo and they're kind of putting that on pause. So if you're a big fan of Allo, sorry to say, there's not going to be a whole lot of development. But they're putting all their efforts into chat, which is not necessarily an app in and of itself. Uh, Google already has an app called Android Messages, which is on a ton of Android phones. It's kind of their their straight up, you know, SMS app. But it supports something called RCS, which stands for Rich Communication Services. That's more think think of it as more of like instant messaging features, but built into something that the carriers support, something similar to SMS. So it's compatible you know, with all the SMS functions, but you also get things like read receipts and a little message that says when the other person is typing currently. Things like that, those expanded functions that on iMessage, the thing you probably take for granted because he's just so used to it being great, um, have. And for whatever reason on Android, we don't have that. But this, this requires Google to, to strike some really successful, you know, have some really successful conversations with the carriers to get them all on board so they support the same uh, format, the same version of RCS, which I think is kind of the big challenge. So I did take it for granted uh, until, as you know, every January when we switch phones and I have to, um, I have to muscle through an entire month of using Android. Feel <laughs> or, sorry for me. Or si or six weeks because <laughs> yeah. that's what you said this yes, last time exactly. and we had to hold ourselves to it. And truth be told, I love everything about Android except for the messaging. It was yeah. like I got totally, um, you know, I felt like on an island by myself. All my iPhone friends didn't really even know what to do anymore. So, um, so I do bubble. feel, I do, I know, right, green bubble. Um, I do feel your pain. So what, what, but I'm not really sure what they're doing here. So they, are they basically saying like, we're not going to make an iMessage clone we've tried 10 times and it's never worked, so make the carriers do it? I think what they're saying is we want all of that functionality, but we want it to be built into some sort or, or have there be greater support for our version of the standard of a rich of RCS that hopefully even iPhones would support because it's it's almost like saying SMS is dated, which it kind of is, right? Like, you, or MMS is dated. You send a photo via MMS and it down the, the photo and what you end up getting. Like, those were uh, things that we were okay with prior, but now that feels like a big compromise. So I think what Google is saying is, we've tried the app approach, that didn't work out so hot. If we can get everybody supporting this one standard the way that we want it to be supported, uh, which I feel like is a tall order, by the way. But if we can get them to do that, then we've kind of changed the norm of how the carriers uh, deal with this type of messaging. And hey, what do you know? We also have a very powerful messaging platform that's supported on Android via Android Messages, the app. Well, I mean, I could have used Allo on my iPhone. I downloaded it and everything, and I sent you one message, and I was like, <laughs> Wasn't it a great message, though? <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't remember. Um, but beyond that, beyond just the fact that I don't know that people would necessarily switch, yeah. um, also updates are handled by the carrier with Android, and that hasn't worked out so well, isn't it? That's the thing yeah. you're also always complaining about. Like, I don't have my updates unless you have a Pixel phone. You're not getting. You have to depend on the carrier to get your security oh, totally. updates, and you're not. So that so we're saying that worked out so well. Let's hand over <laughs> chat to them as well. I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a really great question. Like I said, I don't I don't know how I feel about this. I. I I appreciate where Google is coming from, and I really hope they're able to pull it off. And it sounds like they're throwing a lot of resources 
at it. But I mean, it's a tall order to get a number. And we're not just talking about US carriers. We're talking about, you know, they would want this support to be worldwide. That's mm -hmm. a lot of different, you know, individual uh, organizations with their own efforts going on. They might even have their own flavors of RCS that they want to be the standard and not your standard, Google. And so that's going to be a challenge. Well, I think it's a bigger challenge also because it doesn't support end-to-end -end encryption. That's, um, it's not yeah. on by default, which was the problem with Allo. That's the thing that everybody complained about, and the carriers aren't going to do that. And so that instantly isn't as secure as iMessage. So when I decide to become a Russian spy, I'm not one yet, but I'm not ruling it out, then I'm going to continue <laughs> using iMessage, and not just for the Animojis, but for the end-to-end -end encryption. Yeah. Well, and I mean, end-to-end -end encryption, that's something that you see in, in most messaging yeah, platforms signal, now. Yeah, Signal, Telegram, But that's not WhatsApp. something that you get in SMS. So if you can sup replace SMS with RCS, even though it also doesn't have end-to-end -end encryption, the thing you already don't get via SMS, but you get all these other things. And I think that's where Google's coming from. But I agree. I, I wish that it was end-to-end -end encrypted. That seems like a big fail to me. Well, we'll see. I guess it's rolling out now. I mean, by carrier, like so, you'll get it. Um, you know, the same day you get your security updates. Uh, which is in well, I mean, yeah. I mean, different different flavors, different support is rolling out. But I don't know if this. You know, we're probably honestly, we're probably going to hear more about this at Google I/O okay. next month. Okay. All right. Is it time to walk over to the news Let's desk? Let's walk. And we're going to talk to Zach and Alex about the Nintendo Labo. All right. Let's do it. We'll wander over and take a look at some cardboard projects over here. The <laughs> Nintendo Switch. Nice shades, Alex. Yes. <laughs> they are made out of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are surrounded by lots of cardboard crafts, it seems like. But this is actually high technology. Sitting with Zach and Alex. Uh, Karsten, uh, one of the producers here at Twit, you are his... Uh, sons. Yes. What is that like? Um, <laughs> uh, it's interesting. <laughs> and, That's good, what I expect. And we have a dog. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't good. mean to leave out the dog. I apologize. <laughs> so you guys actually had a really cool, um, well, I, I don't know if challenge is the right word, but this is where it's a, it's a perk to be Karsten's sons, yeah. one of many perks, I'm sure, is that you get, like, I'm, I'm sure you were a Nintendo Switch fan to begin with, but yep. you got to play around with the Nintendo Labo kits, mm -hmm. which, I mean, this is really cool. What what are we looking at here? Because you, you um, basically built this stuff, right? Yeah, we're looking at a lot of cardboard, one rubber band, and a few stickers. Wait, can I press a button? Sure. Oh, it's a piano. So you made this piano, and that's the Switch that's that's in there. That's the Nintendo Switch that's inside. So we've got the Nintendo Switch docked into this cardboard piano. Yep. And obviously, as you can see, that like the idea with Nintendo Labo is that you... <laughs> what what patch is this? What, what sound is this? Is this old person sound? <laughs> Probably. I'm pretty sure that's what that is. Um, so, and, and by the way, you're changing the sound by by yep. putting in these, these like little cardboard modules. Mm -hmm. Yep. That reprograms it. How long did this take to build, start to finish? Three hours, I think. Whoa. Just That's... sitting sitting down, yeah. You yeah. by yourself, Zach? Um, yes. No help from your dad? No. <laughs> or no. your brother. No. Alex, where were you? <laughs> um, I was playing Minecraft. Okay, all right, you're forgiven. That is my big question. Was building this more or less interesting than playing Minecraft? Um... You can honest, honest yes. answer. Building this was more fun than playing oh, Minecraft. Oh, good. Really? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and you guys have, uh, you, you put together a few different pieces, and not only yep. this, which is, it's really hard to not, you know, want to, to play around with the piano, mm -hmm. but, I mean, we've got all these other things. This This right here on the table, this is like, a sheet that is that is obviously unbuilt, and basically this box is just filled with tons yes. of those, right? Yeah. About how many, and what what are the, what's the kind of different uh, things that you can you can build? Um, you can have? build. Well, there's this piano. There is a fishing rod, a house with basically a Tamadachi figure that mm -hmm. lives inside of it. Um, there's a motorcycle thing. Yeah, okay. And basically what is the equivalent Wait. of a hex bug. A hex bug. Like the things that like vibrate around that look like toothbrushes. And okay. then you put the Joy-Con inside that, right? Yep. Is that how they vibrate? Yep. Oh. And then you also, uh, did you make um, Alex's hair, his wig? Yes. Out of cardboard? 
<laughs> that, is a, that is a cardboard whip. No, it's not. But the glasses are cardboard. So, yeah. I mean, as you're unpacking this, like, obviously there's a game component to yeah. it, right? So you've got a little memory card. Like, mm -hmm. does it just come with a, a ton of different memory cards or one memory card it's that all these things tap into? One memory, well, each kit, kit comes with a different memory card, about this big. Let's see, this one actually probably has it. Yeah, that one. <laughs> and it's about this big. That's okay. about it. And you drop that in, and then whatever the cardboard piece that you built, uh, of which there are a lot in there, it's going to automatically recognize what it's connected into, right? You don't have to manually select that well, and say, well, this is the piano. Uh, you kind of, it's a little half and half. You okay. kind of have to click on the piano setting, but then everything else kicks off from there. Like, okay. it knows that now, now that it knows it's the piano, it can like, do piano things. Right, right. Um, so these little nodules have stickers on them. Did mm -hmm. you have to put those on there? Yeah. Oh, and so did you have to, did you put them on right the first time or did it take a few times? Um, I think a few of the stickers I had to like peel off and then peel on because they weren't exactly on correctly, mm. but most of them the first time. Now, did you watch videos or where, how did you learn um, how to do this? Be, all right. <laughs> Basically. This Basically, item has instructions for building. Oh. Yeah, basically, when you first plug in the uh, the game into it, it says, oh, well, you can't play with anything since you haven't built anything. Oh. So, and then it teaches you how to build everything step-by-step -step process. You can rewind, go forward cool. faster. So you, aren't, so you aren't necessarily unboxing a manual because the manual's no, in here. Just, Part of the process mm -hmm. is that it's all kind of start to finish. It's coming from the Nintendo Switch. Yep. Okay. Kind of a bunch of did did, uh, did your dad help you build build um, these? Um, he didn't help me. He helped Alex a little. Alex, what did you build with your dad? A thing. That thing. <laughs> that. Did, did uh, did your dad cry during the making of this? Yes, very yes, much. He did. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I he might. Is it time for you to go put that suit on? It's like a backpack. Yes. I want to see um, you wear that. It's like a mech suit backpack of some kind. Wait, shouldn't I take off the mic because when I get ripped you, in the walking? I think. Uh, oh, are you plugged in? Uh, yes, I am. Plugged okay. In. These kids are smarter than us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we could take that off. Apologies about that. Um, so this is like a mech warrior backpack with, I mean, string. How long? How long did this take? Um, this morning. Come to me. Alex. I'm not sure how long. That oh, okay. <laughs> so we should say this just came out yesterday. I mean, you guys, you guys just got this, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's pretty just impressive. Got it yesterday. Well, I'm gonna start with this. Uh, Alex, can you come on? Start on me. Uh, Couple, and then I'll come out to him. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Alex. Show us how this works. All right, so Alex is going to put this this crazy mech backpack on, and, and actually, this is a little different, right? This for this. It goes into the dock. The Nintendo Switch goes into the dock so that you can kind of see the the effects on the TV screen while mm -hmm. you're wearing this huge uh, cardboard backpack. Is that right? Yep. Zach, I need the red. Um, I just have to switch the games real fast. Ah, uh, okay. So the Joy Cons go in the side of your mask. Oh, that's cool. Oh, is it one on the side of his mask? Go the other way. And <laughs> there we go. I always it's have like you're a welder or something. Masks. Yeah. A, a welder mech warrior combo. Wait, I need to put, it on put the shoes suit. on. <laughs> it's it's a top to bottom look, really. And it's, everything's connected, so you could fight giant robots right now <laughs> and win. Fight giant robots, be a giant. Oh, robot. okay, sorry. It just be, oh, you know, but, there's no fighting. It's but can you? Passive. Yeah, can you fight as a giant oh. robot? Okay, Other you can. Giant oh, robots. okay, no, you crush humans. Oh, he fights aliens. aliens. Oh, aliens. Oh. Aliens and humans. Oh. Aliens and humans. Okay. And then you have the the red the red Joy-Con. Does it go? Uh, oh, it has yeah, little instructions. I'll follow instructions right there. <laughs> the diagram, which makes it pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, and I don't need to do anything once I pop that in there. It automatically figures it out. I think what's interesting about this, to me, is I mean, obviously that it's made of cardboard. How they've made this so operational, from from the perspective of like, 
I mean, there's something that recognizes this design on yeah. this plug, um, so that when you put it in, it changes yeah. things. And I mean, that's is that common through all of these? That there's little um, pieces yeah. like that that do that? Yeah, I, I think that is. Um, basically, the red Joy-Con, which mm -hmm. is the right one, um, comes with a camera, an infrared camera. Ah, that's so So basically, cool. on the other side of this, on the inside, each of these keys has a little sticker to it. <laughs> and when you press the keys... Ah, it, it shows it the movement. Shows, yes. We can show that off. Leave that open because I want to show that off in a second. But right now, right. Uh, we're watching... So <laughs> he's That's so cool. Alex is... You, you basically are a car, essentially. How did he... Oh, so you just stand up like Transformers. <gasps> no More way! Than that was so cool! So, okay... So, so, so when Other Alex way. stood up from the ground, basically his car turned into a walking robot, a destroying robot, uh, destroying the neighborhood, essentially. Uh, oh. And this is gigantic. Oh, oh, oh. Raise one Other arm. Hand. It doesn't work with this either. Now, are you, af are you afraid that it's going to break while you're doing this? Um, kind of. Okay. But has it in, broken in the 24 hours since you've gotten it? No. Okay, so we know it lasts at least 24 hours of fighting aliens and crushing humans. And you can actually challenge a, a friend I mean, on, if you, on this if as you, well? If you have two Nintendo Switches and two Nintendo Labos, you can. Oh, wow. Um, we should say, though, that, uh, that, that they do have replacement parts, which aren't that expensive. Too. Right, like you know, when I when I think about my history with cardboard, it's usually that it doesn't last forever. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, at some point it's going to break down, or especially when you're getting physical with it. Right. You know what I mean? Like stuff's going to happen. Or if you wanted to like carry a pizza in that backpack, it probably wouldn't be a great idea. Yeah, don't do that. Okay. Then you end up with a grease, you know, stain, mm -hmm. and nobody wants that on their their uh, <laughs> video game accessory. Um, what, uh, what haven't you put together yet that you're, like, excited to get to? The fishing rod and the motorbike. Okay, what, what happens when you put the fishing rod together? Is it, like, a fishing game? You, you, you can fish for fish. Uh, yeah. For virtual fish. Uh, okay. And the motorbike, what's that all about? Um, basically, you control a mini That's motorcycle. So cool. And I'm not, I, I'm not too familiar with it since I haven't built it yet, but I think it's more or less Mario Kart 8, but okay. you can control it with the motion controls. Okay, so I imagine that Carson brings home all kinds of uh, toys similar, not exactly like this, but, uh, and then you play with them for a little while. Do you imagine yourself keeping on, continuing to play with this? Um, yeah, for a while. And I remember first watching the trailer for this, and at the end they show off other things too, like there's a Joy-Con, uh, Toy-Con Bazooka, too, and a Toy-Con Swan, and other things. So I'm going to basically finish all of these, and then when another one comes out, I bet they're going to be probably backwards compatible, so right. you can combine all of them. I mean, it's no, this is no, like, lightweight box. Like, this is dense. It's filled with t tons of sheets of projects, essentially. So I imagine, like, hours upon hours uh, not only the building aspect, which is fun in its own right, but then playing the games. But that means that the games should be deep enough to be worth all that effort. And do, have you found that? Like, are, are the games quality in and of themselves? I mean, Alex sure is having a fun time being a giant <laughs> fighting robot. That's obvious. Um, and there's a, there's a, there's a Toy-Con garage as well. Is that what yeah, it's called? Uh, yeah. Basically, you can... Um, it's an if-then formula, and you... Say basically, well, if the screen is touched, then make the left Joy-Con rumble or something like that. So, is there coding involved in that, or is it just? Yeah, colored? it's basically. Yeah, I, I'd say there's coding. I mean, you can get. I remember there was one trailer where it showed if you use Joy-Con Toy-Con Garage, you can make a like guitar oh. out of rubber bands and wow. just making sound. So you could actually cut. You'd cut out the guitar yourself, make mm -hmm. your own stuff. So you're not limited to what they you're have. Not limited, sort of like yeah. Lego. You can make whatever. You can buy a set, or you can make whatever. Start collecting Amazon boxes now. Okay. Really? <laughs> and, and so then, from a from a game like design standpoint, is there like a game maker in there that allows you to I mean, kind of craft that with with if then kind of? I mean, approach. Not really. I guess I haven't gotten through yeah. everything. Yeah. But I know. But you can almost see them kind of yeah. going in that direction because they're really about in, you know teaching 
teaching anyone that's using it to kind of understand yeah. how to how to build a peripheral for a gaming system. I, mm -hmm. I feel like we haven't yeah. seen that very much. And they're not that expensive. The um, the variety kit is that this one? Yep. I believe this is the, the variety one with kit. The piano. Yeah, the piano. Uh, Sixty nine ninety nine for all of the the different projects that you get in here. Uh, I'm not really quite sure exactly how many are in here, but it's a lot. There's a lot of sheets in there. Say. But the piano is, is kind of yeah, worth it. Yeah, piano itself. was the most uh, difficult one. <laughs> so it says age six the plus. Um, but then 10 plus for the games. Mm. Yeah. This one's E anyway. Oh, okay. So. Good to know. Yeah. Um, and then so the robot is 79.99. I just want to get that in there. So do you think it's worth that? I mean, yeah. I mean, <laughs> ten dollars worth of cardboard. I it's mean, like the inside of that is way more than ten dollars. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's basically ten dollars worth of cardboard and a sixty dollar game. Plus okay. the Nintendo Switch. You'd buy. Uh, you have to buy that. Yes. But yeah, separately. I mean, sold separately. Yeah, you're not gonna find the Switch in there yeah, in between no. layers of cardboard, which is too bad because I would totally get one if that were the case. Yeah. Okay, so do no, you, you have to build the Switch out of cardboard? <laughs> well, that's the next step. <laughs> that's their next console. I think yeah. we figured it out. So I presume that you have probably some sort of limits at home, like how much screen time. I don't know if you call it screen time. Screen time at home. Yeah. I call it screen time. <laughs> like, do you think this cons is considered? Like, do you? like the idea that you're making something as opposed to just watching YouTube, which, let's be honest, we'd all spend the day doing if we could. Yeah, I think, yeah, making things is a lot more fun because then y you have something like physical that you can be like, go to your friends, be like, hey, I built a piano. What did you do over your weekend? <laughs> it's true. Who can say that they built a piano? Uh, you can. Yeah, Because you did. Okay, so it we want to... do it. Yeah, we want to prove how long it really takes. So um, while we're doing the rest of the show, you were going to put together the little RC car, which is... All right. Um, and, yeah, so you'll find that. We'll put it together, and then by the end of the show, it's supposed to take... Ten, ten, ten minutes. Ten yeah. minutes, they said, so okay. we got to do the rest of the show really fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we got to fit everything else in in ten minutes. That's the rule. Uh, cool. Zach and Alex, right. thank you so Wait, much. Wait, should I show you, you the inside of the... Yes. Oh, what yeah. what are we missing? Show, show us everything. Inside. Show us the guts. What All are right. we missing? I was hoping there was a pizza oh, in there. Oh, here, you but... know what? I'm going to bring it to you. Uh, this is impressively large. <laughs> there you go. All right. Is there a wild animal inside? Are these the breathing holes? <laughs> no, those are the holes that you can calm it down with electrocution. Oh, all right. <laughs> Technology has not ruined his imagination. That's true. It's a good thing. Technology has only sparked it. Yes, exactly. Words of wisdom. So what are we looking at here? So that's, that's not really. Oh, okay, that's just the face of it. Oh, okay. So, uh, nope. if you had to, <laughs> okay, what what are we looking at here? <laughs> We've got the feet. Oh, the different controls. Okay, now, and this is actually really important to point out because we saw it also with the piano. If you look in the inside, you can see the little white controls attached to the keys, and that's that's what you were talking about as far as the cameras on the controls. Yeah, recognizing these patterns and right there. detecting that motion, and yeah. that's actually how the control happens. It locks mm -hmm. onto those white slivers of of paint or tape or whatever. Yeah. And that's how it controls. Yep. That's that how it really knows what to do. That is really cool stuff. Cool. Um, well, thank the legs you. Legs are in the sides. Sides are in the legs. Right. And they. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There we go. Right on. That is so cool. All right. So how about um, we're gonna we're gonna continue things on and we'll check back in. All right. Uh, with you, Zach and Alex. Thank you for uh, for playing around with this. I'm sure yeah. it didn't didn't seem like work. But, uh, which is a good thing. That's, that's the yeah. beginning of it, right? Uh, and we'll uh, check back in with you and see what All you right. make. Mm -hmm. Right on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, we are now going to walk back over there and answer a call for help. All right, let's do it. It's call for help time. Thank you. Got to walk around. All the folks who, by the way, are here from uh, Western Australia, students from Sacred Heart. Perth. Thank you, guys, for coming out. Yeah. Good luck. Hey, okay, I, I'm going to try something, I, because I've always wanted to do this. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy! Oi, oi, oi! Yes! All right, and with that, it's time for a call for help. We have Justin in Denver, Colorado on the line. Justin, how are you doing? 
I'm good. How about you guys? We're doing awesome. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you for joining us, for taking some time out of your, uh, your Saturday afternoon. Hopefully we can help you out. Uh, give, us, give us a little idea of uh, what, what your uh, question is. Sure. So I'm um, having my first kid in July and I'm a little bit concerned that I'm going to take photos and then later on want to have prints made and have them blown up and the quality is just not going to be there. It's going to be blurry. So I'm wondering if it's necessary to have a dedicated uh, SLR camera or would a mobile phone be sufficient? And if so, which would you recommend? So that's a really good question. First of all, congratulations. Yeah, I'm very excited. Oh, thank and, you very much. Uh, I felt that I couldn't really um, answer this question because when my kids were born, we didn't have like the, we didn't have cell phone cameras back in the day, <laughs> for 15 years ago. Um, all I had was a regular camera. So um, yeah, we, we. How did you live? I don't. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I had a regular camera and I put them up on Smug Mug, um, but. You did uh, have a phone yeah. camera, not a not one that's as good as now, like nine years ago. Yeah, I mean, we're talking 2010 was when we had our our first daughter, and yeah, I think I had a Motorola Droid at the time, but I think we also had a dedicated digital camera, not a big SLR or DSLR or anything like that, just like a, a little dedicated digital camera because, well, I mean, the, the pictures on a Motorola Droid, I, I don't know if you know, but they, they were not very good. They're not what you're talking about or hoping for. So don't use that. So I thought that we would call in an expert, Rishi Sanyal from DP Reviews. We spoke to him about a month ago, and I knew he took these beautiful photos of his daughter who uh, he took some, and I know he had a regular camera and he had uh, the Google Pixel 2. Mm -hmm. And so I thought he could come in and tell you all kinds of things, including like things you might not have thought about, like does a giant camera like in a baby's face, is it scare of them, you know, them, is a phone easier? And of course the thing that we always know is like the best camera is always the one that you have in your pocket Absolutely. every moment. But you're talking about, you'd probably use both, but whether it's worth buying one. So. Thanks for coming on, Rishi, and talking to us. Sure. Yeah, hi. Good to see you again. <laughs> and congratulations. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I know yeah. your daughter was sitting there right next to you um, eating some fruit, fruit on the floor. Not off the floor. <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> uh, pretty much off the floor. <laughs> so you're a photography expert. What do you, what do you think? Does he need a, a standalone camera? Um, that's, that's a million-dollar question. Um, this is something that comes up quite commonly just with my friends, but also um, even on our site and our readers ask us this question all the time. Um, as you said, the best camera is the one that you have on you, right? And this is just always on me. Um, whether it's a Google Pixel or a iPhone or a Samsung, the cameras in these devices have just gotten so good that uh, it's amazing what you can do with it. I mean, sometimes the pictures will look better than what you get with dedicated cameras these days. Uh, and that's because of the computational approaches that uh, smartphones are taking to overcome the limitations of their tiny uh, sensor, tiny camera. So, um, you know, having it on you at all times is a huge factor. And it's also, because it's so small and unobtrusive, um, I'm able to take shots and video without my daughter really like freaking out and just, you know, it's just freezing and being like, what are you doing? Uh, actually, these days when I pull the ca actual camera in front of her, and this is even not that big because mirrorless cameras these days are getting much smaller. This is nice and light. This is a full frame um, mirrorless ILC or interchangeable lens camera. Um, these days, she used to just kind of freeze in front of it, but these days she just runs away. She just walks away um, <laughs> when I point that at her and less so with this. Um, but that said, um, one of the things that you're sacrificing here is um, image quality when you print large or when you look at it at a pixel level. So if you're you know, looking down the road to print um, large prints, which you probably will be um, taking kids, you know, pictures of your kids, uh, there's still a lot of value in having a dedicated camera, um, whether it's you know, a, a camera that you can change the lenses on or a um, they make uh, these little one-inch type sensor cameras that almost fit in your pocket. They're yay big and that thick, um, come with built-in lenses. That also gives you much higher resolution than a phone will give you. And the other thing is kids are always moving, right? They're always running around. Um, and you want to capture some of those candid moments. And particularly, a lot of those moments are going to be indoors in your indoor lighting, and it's very low light. And autofocus matters in those moments, and sensor size does matter. Um, the phones are computationally, you know, trying to make up for that. But 
Um, if you want to take a look at a couple of the examples um, that I sent, um, you know, if you zoom into this, this is taken with an actual full frame uh, mirrorless camera, uh, 42 megapixels. You know, you'll be able to blow this up down the line um, easily, no problem. I think it takes a little while to load. But if you're just looking at images at just an image level, if you scroll to some of the other images there, there's one I just took this morning actually um, with some with a, a tree behind my daughter. Yeah, right, right, that one. You know, if you just look at that at an image level, it looks great. Um, it even got the lighting on her hair and everything, and there's more blur behind her than you'll get with a lot of dedicated cameras. Um, so, and that's all done computationally. But again, if you just if you zoom in all the way, you're going to notice that there's a, there's loss of detail. Um, so it's not a straightforward answer. A lot of it depends on um, how much you're willing to spend, whether or not you're willing to carry one of these around with you all the time. But you know, nailing those candid moments with really good autofocus and uh, low noise imagery, you're still going to fare better with a, a dedicated camera, which is not surprising. That's that's changing. That's changing quickly. It, uh, you know, another consideration. This is a consideration that I've you know had to kind of come to terms with over the years is is facing the reality of what I actually intend to do with any of these photos, like. I've, I've got the, the camera in my pocket. I use it all the time. It, it, I may, it's the camera that I have, so it's the camera that I use most often to, to take pictures of my kids. And we do. We have a DSLR at home, and we got it specifically like two years after we had our first daughter. I got it because I was like, man, it's going to really be nice to have this high-quality camera around. We're going to take, you know, this will be for when we want our pictures to be like frameable and all this kind of stuff. And it was like the effort involved, like having to remember to get it when you're going somewhere, just nine times out of ten. Like, I, I just kind of realized at the end of the day, like, well, really, I just have them in a photo roll anyways. And maybe that's a, you know, I'm sure there are, you know, everybody has a different intention for what they're doing with their photos. But for me, I realized it wasn't worth the effort. You know, ultimately, I'm just happy yeah. to have the pictures and they look fine to me. But other people no, you want to put them, make them big and put them yeah. on the wall. And I get that, too. Well, you raise a very good point. That's just the energy barrier, especially when you become a parent. You know, time yeah. constraints are insane. Um, and one of the real advantages of these things is that all your photos get put up into uh, into the cloud, and there's a digital assistant that'll organize them for you, find faces for you. You know, it's so easy. I can just say, send photos of my daughter to my entire family as soon as it's taken. I don't have to lift a finger, and it'll just do that. And they're also making even printing easier because um, they'll. You know, the assistant, Google Assistant here, will suggest like, hey, here's an album. Do you want me to print it in a photo book? And so you might actually get more products out of um, having a device that automatically uses an assistant because you're just time starved. You see, mm -hmm. you, you know, with a dedicated camera, you might not even get around to printing because, again, it's a time constraint. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's that's an important consideration. Uh, I still do usually just just because this this itself is not that big. I usually still take this with me when I when I you know just going outside. And uh, the way I get around the whole assistant thing is uh, most of the mirrorless cameras these days, uh, a lot of the DSLRs too now, they can you can set them up to automatically transfer the JPEG images to your uh, cloud service like right through your phone, which means they get integrated into the assistant service and cloud. And um, so really, I would think of it as like. I like having both of these on me. I end up taking more photos with this one and videos as well, but um, you know they don't have to be mutually exclusive. You know, mm -hmm. you, you can use one um, or the other depending on the situation and merge your photos together in the cloud. So right now, Justin, you have a Galaxy Note Five, right? Mm -hmm. So you're thinking, do I spend the money to upgrade to the Pixel Two or to get a DSLR? Yeah, or like a you know, DSLR with a mid-range. Um, um, uh, sorry, uh, the mid-range camera, you know, phone. Sorry, phone camera. Mm. Um, so, do you do you use Google Photos? Is that something that you regularly use now? Yep, I do. So everything gets backed up there, and uh, so I, I do like that. I was wondering if you said we're talking about the computational, so it's kind of like the phone uh, and the computation on the back end. So are there like pairs that you, you know, the Pixel 2, um, the uh, S9, is there anything that you would recommend outside of those two? Um, for, you know, for for kid and toddler photography, the, um, the dual pixel autofocus on the Samsung and the Google phones are amazing at, at just nailing focus even as she's moving. Um, there's some constraints with that, like it's these things end up prioritizing the center, um, especially the Google Pixel 2, a little more than 
faces. I think the Samsung's uh, quite good at recognizing faces. Um, the iPhone, um, you're probably an Android, so I don't know if you're going to want to switch to iPhone, but um, we found the iPhone autofocus in general to to fall behind the dual pixel autofocus of Samsung and, and the Pixel 2. Okay. So um, if you're taking pictures of your kid, I, I would definitely recommend um, one of the dual pixel autofocus cameras like the Pixel 2. Uh, we found the portrait mode, uh, which is the background blurring, to be um, much better on the Pixel 2, even in, even compared to some of the latest Huawei's and Samsung's. Um, the iPhones do pr a pretty good job, but um, you know, look at the background blur of that. It's just, I, it's hard to tell. And these, there's some other photos in there that, you know, you don't, you don't have to think of the phone as being a one lens camera either because there are lens attachments you can attach to it and get different focal lengths, get zoom, get wide angle, and autofocus works with those as well. The only trouble you're going to run into is in, in low light indoors um, where the image quality is not going to be as good as you might get from a dedicated camera. How many of your daughter's photos have you printed, Rishi? Ooh, you got me. <laughs> Zero? <laughs> uh, no, that's not true. Um, holiday cards uh, and some other um, framed prints we sent to our family, definitely. And so did but, you use the DSLR prints or did you from the Pixel 2? Those are um, my, from a mirrorless ILC. Yeah. So yeah. you haven't really printed anything from the Pixel 2? You know what? I haven't yet. Have you? I do intend to. Um, let me think here. I mean, really, uh, any of the any of the pictures that we get printed and hang up on our wall are usually from like actual like photo sessions. Like, mm -hmm. all right, it's our spring photo session. Yeah. So a professional photographer is going out with an amazing camera and taking those pictures and a bunch of balloons. Um, there, but although there there have been a couple, I have I have gotten a few uh, framed from the first generation Pixel, not the Pixel Two that mm. that I have right now. But uh, you know, like I said, it's just not part of my my habit, my routine. So it's not as high <laughs> importance. I I will say, through using the Pixel 2 XL and the computational stuff that it does with the auto blur uh, or the background blurring is a great effect like 90% of the time. But there's the 10% of the time where it's just like, yeah. you know, shining through the, the piece of hair to the background. It's perfectly yeah. sharp, that background there yeah. versus totally blurry all around. And weird little sure. things like that can happen. So just to keep an eye yeah. out for that. But well, it's not doing well, the two other things I would keep in mind, though, are just, you know, do you want to get into and learn photography and camera, or do you just right. want to hit a single button? Because the phones, you just, you just press a single button, and it just auto-exposes and auto-focuses and everything. Yeah. Um, so And that, and obviously budget. We actually have a, a parent's buying guide on our site. If you go to dpreview.com and just um, search for uh, parent's buying guide, we have a couple of dedicated cameras that we recommend that are under $1,000 uh, that will do the job really well. But I think the biggest question comes down to, if you really want to take the time to learn uh, and, and grow into a system and always take that separate camera with you, yeah, there you go. Or do you just want to click one button and just get it all taken care of for you? Yeah. I do know, Justin, that if you can answer this question correctly, everything else in parenting will be easy. This is probably the <laughs> hardest thing you'll have to deal with your whole... All right. <laughs> I'm speaking yes. of a mother it's, of teenagers. This is Everything else is a walk of the park. This is the only <laughs> challenge that you'll ever face as a parent. Basically. I'm catching a little flack for that. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, this is the one thing you're worried about. But, you know? and I was like, I got everything else. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? That, that may be the case, but down the line, you do really appreciate having great photos. You know what yeah. I mean? Whether you plan to frame them or not I mean you you know you hear it all the time and you will say it at some point down the line but time moves fast when you have a kid and you blink and suddenly they're way older and you wish you had more uh, more captured of, of them being young because that was a that's in the past now you know so it is an important uh, consideration absolutely yeah I kind of want to just future proof a little bit I don't have any expectations to print but if you know the grandparents you know yep. um, aunts uncles things like that they're gonna want them so I just want to not cut look back and go darn it yeah yeah that's you know nice. our, if you just, in that guide that our top recommendation is actually a very small it's called an arcs hundred five it is expensive it's 950 dollars yeah the rx105 right there but it'll fit in your pocket so it's not much of a burden to carry with you it has eye detection autofocus it'll find your kid's eye and focus on it even at 24 frames per second it'll shoot gorgeous 4k video um so you'll always have high quality video there that you can you can edit 20 years down the line once your kid's in college <laughs> but you'll right. at least have all that with you and uh that quality is going to it's going to far surpass most smartphones, with with the exception of um, 
the computational blur where sometimes the if the smartphone pulls it off right, yeah. the Pixel 2 might actually surprise you and make something look like you shot it with a full frame oh, professional level ILC. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thanks for the question and thanks for the answer. <laughs> what are we doing here? Why, why are we here? complicated. <laughs> it is. Rishi, we really appreciate your help on this. DPReview.com, Rishi Sanyal, and uh, you can find the write up that he's talking about there. Uh, thank you, Rishi. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And, and congratulations again. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, yeah congrats, thanks, Justin. Justin. Uh, did we hopefully give you some, some or did we just make it uh, a hard, more difficult challenge <laughs> to figure out? I, I'm not even quite sure. <laughs> no, I think I've got a lot on my plate coming up. So like you were saying, the uh, learning, you know, the you know how to use the camera and everything, I think the smartphone is going to be the way to go. Yeah. So, um, and then add the, the camera in if I have free time. Yeah. Sounds right. good. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> All right. Well, best yeah. of luck and congratulations. All right. Thank take you, guys. Care. Have a good one. All right. Have, take have care, guys. One. All right. Have a good afternoon. Uh, next week, by the way, I'm going to be back. I'm going to be standing here. I don't know if I'll be on this side or that side, mm -hmm. but I'm going to be here uh, with Rich DeMuro once again on this show. If you want us to answer your tech question, you can do that. Here's how. Need tech help? The new screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to new screensavers at twit.tv. Motion capture is big these days, whether games, movies, even for research. Jason got to put on a little mocap suit, mm. and I got to make fun of him, so let's take a look. <laughs> 3D motion tracking is very popular. It's used in video games. You've seen it in movies. It's even used for research. But unless you have a giant studio with a lot of different devices everywhere, it can be difficult. But a company called Xsense makes it a lot easier. They have a suit that Jason has been willing to wear. Uh, this is my normal dress for the day. <laughs> and we're talking to Christopher Adamson, who is the senior product specialist yep. at Xsense. Thanks for coming on. No problem. Happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about uh, what makes this suit so special. Why do I feel so constricted? Yeah, so Xsense, uh, as a company, we kind of actually have three segments. We have a segment making single sensors for industrial applications, for like drone stabilization, things like that. We have a segment for movement science, for sports rehabilitation, prosthetic research, the things you were just mentioning. And then 3D character animation is what I specialize in. Uh, we have two sets of hardware. Jason, you're wearing the Owinda system right now, which is a fully wireless 17 trackers that go to a single USB hub. And then we have a full Lycra suit version, but both are great systems. This one's typically used for starting off animators, schools, um, because of the ease to get in and out of this system. Um, everything for the hardware then comes into our software, MVN Animate where we calculate it on a humanoid structure and give data for games and films and everything. I feel like with motion capture, I'm used to seeing like the big, I mean, it, this is a little bit of a suit, but it's not the full body suit that I'm used yeah. to seeing. <laughs> I mean, is, is this at its core what makes this system different or do you also offer that and why would you choose one versus the other? Yeah, um, what makes this system different is it is inertial based motion capture. So it's actually relying on an IMU sensor, which is a gyroscope tracking rotation, a magnetometer tracking magnetic north, and accelerometer tracking gravitational pull. Um, what that means is you don't need optical, you don't need a bunch of cameras for a right. stage. It's your body moving sensors, then getting calculated into our software. So it's zero occlusion, 100% of the body movement, go anywhere mocap. We went to visit 2K Games a little while ago, and they had, well, we were in, you know, we were doing NBA 2K. They had a giant gym and so much stuff. I mean, how is that different? How can you do all that without all that giant, all the million cameras everywhere? Yeah, so it's it's two different technologies, and they both, they both have their pluses and minuses. Um, so for an optical system, it's three cameras that triangulate a point. So how that works is off of translation. It's going to give you perfect translational accuracy. How an inertial system works is it's completely off rotation. So you get body measurements to get the proper global position. It's just, there's two ways to skin that cat and uh, both systems play a role in where they need to go in the motion capture world. So you said that this has been used in like every Marvel movie and um, so this same system or the body suit do you, they usually use? Well, yeah, I mean, um, most, 
major films and games company own systems like this. Um, uh, it's, they'll use both. Actually, a lot of game studios do prefer the Awinda system because they'll have a lot of animators going in the suit. So typically a Lycra, a full Lycra like wetsuit isn't going to be something that a lot of animators want to get in, especially if you have one that doesn't like to shower or anything like that. It's kind of <laughs> stinky yeah. and weird. So they go with the Awinda. Uh, but then a lot of big, you know, big stages that you're kind of used to will go with the Lycra suit. So they'll actually wear the Link system, is what we call it, and get that fidelity and motion capture they're used to. So the same system is used for video games and movies and prosthetic research? It's so, yeah, it's the same hardware. There's the Awinda and the Link. But then, so for the movement science and sports and everything like that, it, it feeds into a different software that is kind of more open with the algorithms it can give you. For the animation software, it's you record and export. You can do things like time code. You can live stream into other programs so you can see it your character directly on a 3D character, like um, Unity, Motion Builder, Maya, Unreal, all sorts of things. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I, I feel like I need to keep moving. Like, if I'm staying still, then I'm doing the, yeah, as a the product technology specialist, a disservice. As a product specialist, it's always like, you could tell if somebody's first time in a mocap suit, it's just immediate dance moves. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of can't help it. I mean, it does the worm pretty, yeah. pretty effectively. That, that's that's pretty impressive. So he seems to really like this suit. His yeah. birthday's in September. How much do I have to save in order <laughs> to buy him one just like this by then? Yeah, so, well, typically, if you're a studio, the package ranges um, for software and hardware. We have different license schemes, things like that. So the package could be from 12000 to 34000 but we actually just released an indie program, which what that is is you'll buy just the hardware, you own the hardware, and then you'll actually have one year of pro software, so our highest tier is software, for free. So if you're an indie program, you can check out that indie specs, what that means, and then that would be 7,500 for this Awinda system or 12,200 for the full link setup. And how far does it go? Like, how, how far could he get before we would lose? Signal? Yeah, so with the Awinda system, um, it has a range of 150 feet from the USB hub here. So I could go for like a little walk down the hallway and it would probably yeah. oh, continue no. to it'd capture? Be, it'll be fine. Okay. Um, and then we <laughs> have Bye. we have a USB stick. So people will actually take a Surface tablet, put the USB stick in it, and then put it in a backpack. Then your range is limitless. Then the Link system actually has on-body recording. So the full Lycra suit can actually record for up to 12 hours on a little built-in SD card. So you don't even need a computer. That's when people are doing skiing and skydiving and things like that. We actually developed that technology for movement science for like uh, century race or something like that, or running a marathon to actually see you know the, fa the fatigue in athletes. But we're seeing it used a lot in the animation field for when people are like doing car chase scenes or something like that and need to motion capture their movements, then people are using on-body recording. So prosthetic research and fatigue for marathoners, what are some of the other research applications for this? For the movement science, yeah, um, a lot of ergonomics. So if you're in a factory and you need to see how people are moving constantly, that's a pretty typical application a lot of sports sciences. It's endless. I'm, I'm the 3D character animation guy, so I know roughly what they do, but mostly my customers are the film and game people. The, obviously, the system is based around a humanoid character, but you can also track other objects that link into the person that's being tracked, right? Like, yeah. how, how, uh, how precision based is that tracking like on an object that a humanoid is or a humanoid a human is actually interacting with both systems can support up to four additional trackers okay so it's it's based so your your movement of your body is based off your measurements right so the prop itself is based off of the movement of a segment of your body so you're going to put the prop on your hand it's going to be like good for a sword or like a sheath or wings or a tail or people even put it on their jaw to get a jaw movement, things like that. Um, so that's going to track 100% of the data. Um, what our prop trackers don't work for so much is like basketballs or something that's going to leave your hand because we still need that translation from our body segment. 
You want to pretend you have a sword, don't you, Jason? I, I would love that. <laughs> so we had to recalibrate. Jason now has his sword, the sword he's always wanted. Isn't this a beautiful sword? <laughs> Yeah, so we got a sensor right there. And all, you know, I was actually really surprised when you were putting this on. I, I just kind of figured there would need to be two, one, one out at the end and one at the base. But really, this one sword seems to capture the movement entirely. Yeah, it's going to capture the whole rotation from yeah. the segment of your body on. So. Right. That's really cool. So obviously in a scene, if this, if this was a scene that I was recording in Hollywood, I'm available, um, <laughs> you would want more than just one person in a, in a sword fight. So how many of these systems could you have running concurrently to capture all of that data and yeah. take it into a um, So at our software, MVN Animate, can support up to four characters at a time. Uh, we do have people that will use like three computers, each running four, so eight and 12 kind of setups. And that is the big benefit of our system because there's no markers, you don't get any occlusion. So if you were to go like hug somebody or roll on the ground, you're going to get 100% of the body movement. So you can uh, add clothes or like a costume or uniform or anything to that? In our software, it's, it's this biomechanical model and it's actually very researched biomechanical model. It was a few PhD projects and it's so that biomechanical model you see is what we project. Um, but like I said, our software can live stream into Unity and Motion Builder and Maya and Unreal. So we can just go directly onto a 3D character. I can show you it. What is typical for this is if a talent wants to see how they actually look on a 3D character and how to act, then they can see this reference. Um, people will also use it as a recording feature. So if you're just doing previs and need to get a lot of movement really fast. You can just put the suit on and record directly into Maya or Motion Builder, and it'll directly record onto that 3D character. So some for some really fast motion capture. We were also talking a little bit about uh, HD reprocessing. Yeah. Uh, to kind of clean things up. What, what's that all about? Yeah. So um, we had this new software release in about November, um, but it was one of the most significant releases we've had for XSense. It's actually an engine, so how we're taking the sensor data and processing it within our software that we've been working on for almost 10 years now. So we're taking all this sensor data and the new engine actually has magnetic immunity, so you don't get any sort of segment drift, which is revolutionary for inertial motion capture. But we also added HD reprocessing, and what that does is it takes a recorded file and then it will do a, a sort of render process that actually gets rid of the foot shaking and any other jitters that you might typically see in motion capture data. A typical high dynamic motion of a file, you might see some sort of shake. So if you see, the sternum will shake right there, <laughs> and then his foot kind of twists when he lands. Yeah. So that's actually the tracker is jumping around on his body, so the reprocess is going to solve that. So then if I actually go to what that file is after the HD reprocess, you're going to get something more like this. So no shake in the sternum and the foot lands oh, perfectly wow. nice. Yeah. So you can imagine this is a huge leap because in animation, an uh, animator receives mocap data. And a lot of times what they do is they're just fixing like little foot jitters and kind of like shakes of the sternum or something like that. If you don't have to do that, then you get 100 times more motion capture data, more movements, better quality. More efficient, happier people. Yeah, more efficiency more on the movements. back end because they don't have to remove all that stuff. Yes. <laughs> okay, so anyone who's watching this who says you have the coolest job ever, what would you uh, recommend? Would you recommend people learn Maya, Unity, all of it? What would you recommend people? Uh, as far as motion capture goes, Motion Builder is the big mocap tool. That's for where most people do the cleaning and then putting at the actual data on 3D characters. But we're seeing a lot of Unreal and Unity, the game engines really just blowing up because they're almost making cinema quality renders in real time. So that real time kind of application is what's getting huge in the motion capture world right now for sure. And now the systems are capable enough to, to yeah. keep up with it. Yeah, real time when you can uh, just jump in a suit and then shoot your movie as yeah. 
whatever, an alien or something. Then and not be locked into be a studio either, which is w a really big benefit of this system. You know, you, sh you, you guys have a, uh, a demonstration video on your site of a woman dancing surround, you know, out in a kind of a, a loading dock, yeah. you know, and like ev the world becomes your studio at that point. Yes, yeah, totally go anywhere. If you need a jungle gym because you need a monkey bar scene, go do that. Or if you need a forest, go to a forest. It's great. Go anywhere mocap, really. <laughs> well, Chris Adamson, you are the senior product specialist. Thanks so much for yeah. joining us. Yeah, thank no you. No problem. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. cool. Should so we like, dance us out of here? Okay, sure. I can do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. How about a kick? <laughs> kick. <laughs> I'm going to kick you, Anthony. <clears throat> you had too much fun doing that. Uh, a little bit. It was it was fun actually. Kind of, it felt very official. Although I wish, like in the end, I would end up with like a 3D model that I could do something with. Mm -hmm. But I guess the, the recorded video is kind of that. Somebody in the chat room asked if you took off the thing on your head that that would your would it look like your head flew off? Which we should try that. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know the answer. I don't know if it would look like my head flew off. I think it would probably just throw off the the tracking a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing because when we actually put the sensor on the sword and then I put the sword down on a table, it wasn't like the sword in the rendered version was suddenly away from my body. It was still attached to my hand. Mm -hmm. So I imagine it would probably be the same uh, for the head. The head would be attached to the body of, of the digital person and would just be like constantly looking up or mm -hmm. something like that, something strange like that. Too bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We should check in on this, right? Oh yes, because Zach had, finished it off. We had a little, a little bit of a challenge here, and uh, Zach and Alex came through completely. As you can see, apparently this is a vehicle, which, when used with the controller, you can actually get it to turn. It, it, basically, you can adjust the frequency of how it vibrates. So yeah, so that's the the Joy Cons just vibrating. That's it. That's, that's cardboard, all? cardboard. The Joy Cons and the controller. <laughs> they call it the RC car. Yeah, it, I mean he was finished with this a while ago. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't look like it took very long. Um, you're not going to sneak up on anyone with this thing by any stretch. But you could <laughs> like a little put, noisy. You could put like a drink on there and then just like. <laughs> Your drink, sir, in 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, yeah, if you needed to, yeah. Shaken, not stirred, exactly. or spilled all over the place because it's carpeted floors. Um, yeah. So, anyways, that's that's awesome. Yeah. That, that's how easy it is and, uh, to put that together. And I'm going to see if I can walk away with the switch today. So okay. that it's mine. You're gonna have to it's time for the mailbag. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, I, I feel so honored that I get to be the one to open Why didn't up the we put the mail on the RC car? That would have been good and have it. Yeah, it's true because there's no Dinty Moore beef stew in here. Oh, no, um, do bad. you want to? Oh, here. Yeah. I'll do this. I'll choose this okay. one. And um, wait, I want that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Thank you. All right, you go first. I'll go first. Uh, this is from Girish, uh, who says, My family is constantly taking photos and videos of my six-month-old son, Ari, primarily on our iPhones, which get backed up to their iCloud storage. I'd like a way to back up the original versions from their devices to a central location. My idea was to log into each person's iCloud account and download their photos and videos of him and upload them all to a Dropbox folder. But I'm sure there must be a better way to do it than hacking into my family's iCloud accounts. He didn't say that. <laughs> He's going to get their permission. There is a better way, iCloud photo sharing. Um, which is so great. I just went on a vacation with my cousin and my daughter and my sister, and we did this. Like everybody takes their photos, and then you just share them to iCloud sharing, and then they're there in one fol folder, and then you can back them up either on your own iCloud or on Dropbox or whatever. So can you see, Alex? Can you see my, am I mirroring my? I think I am, right? Nope. You, let's, let's see. Ooh. Living room. Okay. Can you mirror, see me now? Mirror, there we go. Mirror. There we go. Okay, so um, I have all these photos that I just took. Let's go to photos. Um, and I took all these pictures of Alex and Zach. And let's say I want to create, I want to share them. So I select that one and then I just hit the share sheet. Can you see the, the share sheet down there? You go, Why can't you see that? Oh, okay, there's there the go. share sheet. And then you just scroll over to iCloud Cloud Photo Sharing, and I've created this shared album, The Children Are Our Future, and I can say, uh, treat them well. <laughs> and, uh, and then I've already shared this, 
I shared this with you, Jerry, so you're going to get all these pictures. I can't share with Karsten because he has an Android phone, but you said that all of your your family was taking pictures with their iPhones and loading them on iCloud storage. So then I post it, and it's there. Um, so you can see if you just go to shared, like, for example, here's my album of my photos that I took from my trip to Brooklyn. So they're not only just my photos, they're all uh, my sister's photos and my cousin's photos, and then you can back those up any way that you want. So um, nice. that is, and so if you look at my phone, Jerry just joined the Children Are Our Future. Can you see um, there? Uh, well, on my phone, I'm like, I got a notification. So if someone, when you, you're gonna have to tell, if your family has never used iCloud photo sharing, you'll have to tell them, they won't get a notification in text or anything, they'll get it in their Photos app. So they'll have to open their Photos app and it'll right. have that little red one and then it'll say, oh, like someone invited me to join their album. Um, but you can't join the album either because you're on Android. Phone. I can't do it in that app, but Google Photos has this functionality as well. Oh, so it so has the shared uh, photo functionality, and again, same deal. It's you you find that within the the Photos app. So and, uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. And there is a limit. I think it's like three thousand or five thousand photos. <laughs> Only five thousand photos. <laughs> but they said they're taking a lot. I mean, you take a lot of photos of babies. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> It's true. Um, I used so, to be yeah. really good at ma at managing our shared photo album of our kids. Like I, every week, it was part of my routine. Oh, man, I've so fallen out of the habit of that. It became a job, basically. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, what thanks, is Jay. going on uh, there? <laughs> so that's a really close up picture of me. <laughs> uh, that was a selfie I took with the children who are our future. They are our future. Treat them well. As evidenced Let them lead by the way. their ability to build things. Uh, Evan wrote in to say, Hi, Jason and Megan. I've been having some strange issues with my Note 8 camera and other software hiccups and would like to do a factory reset to see if that helps. I'm currently using Action Launcher and I wanted to know how to back up everything, basically a mirror image, or is that a bad idea because the issues that caused the problems uh, in the first place would still be there? Um, there is a backup option on the Note 8 in settings that you'll find. Uh, usually on Android phones you can find a, a backup option in there. It's going to allow for the restore of apps, data, contacts, and photos. So it's not a bit-for-bit bit backup. It's not the way we think of backup on a desktop where you're like, I'm gonna back up this drive and here's a disk image which is, you know, I can reflash later and it's back to its original state. This is, take all the important pieces of information that you have stored on your Note 8, back it up to an external source. You can do that to an SD card or other places. And then you would factory reset your phone and then restore those elements in. So that might actually fix the problem of the weird kind of hiccups that you're experiencing because the factory reset would bring you back to uh, the way you, you, know, you probably started with the phone. And then you could bring that stuff in and you're, I, I think that might be good enough for what you're talking about. If you wanted to do an actual disk image backup bit by bit, I mean, I don't really know what solution you have other than what I've done in the past, which is root my phone, get root access on my phone. The problem with that in this particular situation is that when you do that, you have to wipe the phone to start with root. And so that would have only that would only help you now if you had rooted your phone before you loaded it with everything that you have on it now. At this point, if you rooted, it would wipe it completely and it would be protected for the next time you could do a full disk image um, backup of it that way. So that's obviously not going to help you out. Uh, so I think you kind of just have to stick to the, the system uh, backup that you'll find in the system settings. And then Evan had another question. I'll throw this out here real quick. He says, a follow-up question. If you have time, I recently switched from iPhone and it had the ability to highlight any text and have it read uh, out loud with options for accents and speed. Anything like that for Android that would work across all apps. And yes, so if you're on the Note 8, then you have Android O, you have Oreo, and there is a new TalkBack feature. TalkBack is kind of like the system, uh, the, the system setting for uh, text to voice. Uh, there's a TalkBack feature called Select to Speak, and when you enable that, I can, here, we didn't set up a camera, but I'll show you at the bottom of my screen if it's at all possible. Down at the very, very bottom is a little accessibility human uh, person <laughs> down there. If I tap that, I get this little over the top of the screen uh, pull out. And what that allows me to do is then to go up here to this wonderful tweet of my dog and select it. Jason Howell, 
my dog every time I get out of my chair and walk around the house at this time of day. <laughs> okay, all right. I don't need to play the rest. If you really need, want to know the end of that story, you can check out my Twitter feed. But um, And so basically, it allows you to do just that. You select the portion of the screen that you want read out loud, and it'll do that with those controls down at the bottom that you can pause it. There's a, you can also go into settings and change how it sounds, put a different voice in there, slow down the speed, all that kind of stuff. It's called Select to Speak, and it does mm. exactly what you need. Mm. Putting out fires in this place. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You know, people always talk about how iPhones are so much better at accessibility than Android phones are, but I think maybe just the settings are often hidden. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right, people do, and I don't know if there's more, uh, there's been more work uh, focused on that. Apple has made, made it a, it's, you know, to a certain degree, they've made it a priority, and they've made it a public priority to say that, yes, our, our platform is very good for those accessibility features. I feel like Android for a long time has been playing catch up. Um, but, you know, then again, really, when it comes down to it, you have to ask someone who actually uses those features because they have to, mm -hmm. whether it's good enough. I would say that, that Android's a lot better now than it used to be. I don't know if it checks all the boxes, mm -hmm. though, for someone who really need, relies on that technology, you yeah. know. Well, if you do, let us know. Uh, yeah. Email us. Uh, you can just email me, Megan, at twit.tv. Because we like to hear. We, it's hard for us to review accessibility features because we don't really uh, use them um, in a pinch. Right. Like, so if you do, we yeah, always want to hear from you. Yeah. Megan at twit.tv. Awesome. Twit I think we did it. We did it. Well, we have some, we have some, uh, some little work. We got we to gotta tell people about the newsletter. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Subscribe okay. to it. Twit has a newsletter. Jerry works very hard on it. He works um, all night. <laughs> He's like, uh, I don't know how to work hard. <laughs> Twit.tv slash newsletter. <laughs> then you get all the important stuff in your email box, news announcements, uh, yeah, what's coming up. Yeah, clips from the show, mm -hmm. the promo, all sorts of stuff. You can also subscribe to this show by going to twit.tv slash NSS. That's where you can find all of your uh, your podcast links, audio, video, everything that you need to find for this show is at twit.tv slash NSS. And if you don't want to email me, Megan at twit.tv, if you don't want uh, to engage with me at all, you can email <laughs> new screensavers at twit.tv because then you'll engage with Jerry and he's not as nice as me, so just be and, aware. And, and apparently he's not working hard on the newsletter, so he needs <laughs> something to do. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what, what else? Uh, YouTube.com slash the new screensavers if you want to find us on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes it really easy uh, to do so there. Once again, big thanks to Zach, to Alex for showing us this awesome Nintendo stuff. Big thanks to Sacred Heart and the students who are here watching the show here in studio, put applying a little bit of extra pressure because boy, it's it's a little intimidating doing this show with this big of an audience, but but we did it. Mm -hmm. I think that's about it. Yeah. All so right. Should we Megan. high five? Uh, is that what we do here? We yeah. We we have okay. To, we We're can. gonna high five. Thanks for joining us for this episode <laughs> of the new screensavers. We'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>